So when you want to talk about uh, uptakes, either by land or the ocean, you need to know the fluxes, right? So there is a reservoir of carbon uh, in the ocean and there is a reservoir of carbon in the atmosphere and the exchange happens through the so-called fluxes, either coming out from the ocean into the atmosphere or going from the atmosphere into the ocean. Same thing for land. You have land carbon, atmosphere carbon and then exchange. Of course, there is also exchange between land and ocean as we talked about uh, weathering calcium carbonate and other organic matter coming with the rivers and of course groundwater as well. Um, the f general formulation for gas flux is uh, some piston velocity. It's the speed with which the uh, exchanges are being driven uh, at the interface and the Henry's law gas solubility that we looked at before it's non uh, ideal so strictly speaking it's the apparent constant denoted with a prime so that's 1 over k prime h times the difference in the partial pressure of CO2 in the air and in the water literally it is like the coke can it's cold and it's pressurized and sealed so the co2 is being held inside if you open the can you're going to uh, allow the uh, pco2 of dissolved co2 in the coke to be compared with the pco2 in the atmosphere above and it's going to lose because you have put co2 at high pressure into the coke so in the ocean, where the seawater PCO2 is higher than the atmosphere, the flux is going to go out of the ocean, uh, of course, depending on these factors uh, in terms of the amplification. Uh, and there are places where CO2 in the atmosphere is higher, so the uh, ocean is going to take it up. Okay, so here, KH is the Henry's law uh, gas solubility. Uh, converting the units of pressure PCO2 to concentration of H2CO3 star, remember the hydrated and the dissolved CO2 that we uh, talked about before, in moles per volume. Uh, we talked about the carbonate system pH chemistry before of CO2 plus H2O, H2CO3 going to HCO3 minus H plus and then HCO3 minus going to CO3 minus minus plus H plus and so on and so forth, right? Um, to make this work out, the units of uh, k-piston have to be length per time, for example, meters per day. And for this reason, k-piston is called the piston velocity. Imagine a piston going back and forth in a cylinder to drive uh, compression and expansion of, let's say, the uh, fuel mixture. Typical piston velocity for the sea surface is about 3 meters per day, so that water column of 100 meter depth would equilibrate on a time scale about uh, 33 days about a month but of course the ocean is uh, deep and it's got all kinds of circulations in the horizontal vertical mixing and so on and so forth so obviously this is a difficult uh, issue and measuring co2 uh, fluxes is not on the ocean especially is not at all an easy task on land they put up a tower which measures something called eddy covariance so the uh, velocity and CO2 going down and velocity and CO2 going up at different heights which determines how broad a range it represents in terms of the CO2 fluxes and so on. Doing it on the ocean not so easy, right? Um, quickly to go through how we would estimate the lifetime in years of a CO2 pool, you will take the inventory in gigaton carbon uh, of what's in the stock reservoir size divide by the flux which is in gigaton carbon per year. Usually it also has a uh, area, meter squared, because you're looking at a piece of the ocean or land. Nonetheless, if we take, for example, uh, atmosphere of uh, 700 gigaton uh, storage, uh, which is less, the, which is double the ppm, as you remember, divide by the flux of 210 gigaton carbon per year, that gives you a short three and a half year lifetime. But this is an exchange process. A molecule is getting into the atmosphere and out of the atmosphere, either into the ocean or onto land. What you really need is uh, much more of a one-way fluxes, how much is raining out of the atmosphere or coming into the atmosphere. So in that case, it's more like a residence time, 
whose formal definition uh, looks like this. You have a reservoir with a storage of Q and there is an influx and there is an outflux. In a steady state the residence time would be just Q divided by F in or F out because they would be the same in equilibrium. So that's what is shown here, the inventory divided by the flux. So 200 gigatons divided by let's say 2 gigaton carbon per year of a flux which would give you a hundred year um, lifetime which is much more the uh, correct order of uh, magnitude. Uh, you can look at various pools in the ocean like at the bottom you'll have thousands, tens of thousands of reservoir size and just a tiny uh, flux so you will get uh, residence times of the order of million years for example. Okay, So those are the kind of things you have to be used to. In a non-equilibrium situation uh, obviously they won't be equal so then you talk about characteristic response time. So if you suddenly released something like a, a plume of radiation how long will it take for it to die out? What are the processes that will take it out after the burst of flux and so on? So we won't go into the details, but ocean uptake is going to depend on these sorts of details. Okay, measurements are very difficult. Ships go out and measure it uh, whenever they can. So you have data that is very sparse in space and time and it's measured in different seasons, different years and so on and so forth. Often they are com combined in a very judicious way to give you mean pictures for a base period something like February 2000 here, July 2005. So this is just showing the partial pressure of CO2 in the surface. So you can see that the partial pressure is high here in terms of microatmospheres at the given SSTs in February or in July. So you can see that there is high pressure here and depending on the pres uh, partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere flux could be out. Here partial pressure is lower, typically the subtropical gyre. If you go and look up the circulation in my oceanography course for example, uh, you will have converging waters, downwelling waters and so on. Whereas in July the temperatures are very different. February temperatures are very different and you can see the numbers are very different here. This is in the order of uh, 375 to 4 uh, or so. Here it's more like 300 microatmospheres or so and there are uh, high pressures here as well but they change sign with the seasons as well as you can see here also. So the circulation and the temperatures, the solubility and so on and so forth and where the ocean is exposing cold waters to the surface in uh, high latitudes where there is a lot of cold waters from the surface to the bottom. So all these details uh, determine the PCO2 and for determining the air CPCO2 difference what brings up PCO2 at the surface? Why is it high here and low here? Uh, for example, depends on where the water is coming from. So on the equator, if you remember your Coriolis, if not go and look up the podcast I have. Uh, wi trade winds are blowing, Coriolis is pushing water away from the equator as you can see here with the arrows, which means cold water from below has to come up. If you remember your CO2 profile, CO2 is higher below the surface with cold waters, higher pressures and remineralization of the organic matter, respiration and so on. So higher CO2 is coming up with the upwelling, uh, so you have high PCO2 here throughout the year um, relative to elsewhere. And you can get similar pictures on the coast, uh, so depending on which hemisphere you are in, uh, alongshore winds and Coriolis together can create upwelling as you drive Ekman transport or the wind driven transport away from the coast in uh, depending on the hemisphere. So we looked at this contrast of CO2 uh, in the o oceans uh, on the equator. This is more for the uh, subtropical gyres in higher latitudes where the deep water formation here affects the distribution. Older waters here accumulate more carbon but in general 
this is the uh, typical profile so when you upwell you're going to bring this high CO2 water closer to the surface and increase PCO2 at the surface and often drive out gassing from the ocean into the atmosphere. This is of course going together with biological production which is trying to draw down the CO2 that's why CO2 is lower here. So it's always a question of whether it's the solubility pump driven by the upwelling and cold temperatures that controls the, the ocean PCO2 and the air sea CO2 flux or whether it's the biological pump. Typically, very few places a uh, biological pump is strong enough to dominate the solubility pump. Okay, So this is how the CO2 flux uh, with the reference year of 2000 would look like. So this is now exchange of CO2 between the ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, it's given in moles of carbon per meter squared per year, so per unit area per year in moles of carbon. And you can see that it is positive here, so it's going out of the ocean. The ocean is taking it up here in the Gulf Stream extension region, the Kuroshio extension region, and these um, southern ocean regions uh, south of the subtropical front. Okay? And Interannual variability is high. Here it's going to be dominated by things like El Nino, which you may not have heard of or may have heard of. If you want to learn, again, I have podcasts you can go and watch. Um, and there are places where the magnitude is quite small, you can see in the Indian Ocean. So it's often hard to know whether the Indian Ocean is uh, in a net emitting carbon to the ocean uh, atmosphere or taking it up. Taking it up and how these things are changing with global warming and so on. Okay, Southern Ocean data is less, but nonetheless it's a stormy region, so the variance will be high, similarly here in higher latitudes, stormier Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. So that's what determines how ocean is taking up or belching out carbon dioxide. We'll try to put that in the context of the perturbations to the global carbon cycle and see what are the actual numbers we are looking for. It turns out that those are small differences between large numbers. So measurements uh, are difficult enough and lack of sufficient data makes it very difficult to always track the sources and sinks and the response of the sources and sinks to the emissions and also natural variability like El Nino and so on in some places. Okay.